And our main story tonight is the Cultural Revolution. Not that Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution that happened in Indonesia where the CIA supported Suharto in killing hundreds of thousands of innocent Indonesians. Do you remember that episode of Last Week Tonight? Me neither. In 1965, six Indonesian generals were killed by a number of military conspirators declaring that a right-wing coup was about to happen and that these new generals needed to be neutralized. They then went on to declare that they were leading the new government of Indonesia and that they had the CIA's support. This would be known as the September 30th movement. What they wouldn't know was that they were just a pawn in the CIA's quest for global supremacy. When word of the coup reached one of Sukarno's lower ranking generals, Suharto, he moved in quick, declaring that he was acting on behalf of the president to end the coup and to restore order in Indonesia. Now, a little bit about Indonesia. Sukarno had led them to independence from the Dutch in 1949 and established a decentralized system where the islands ran with a fair degree of independence, but still answered to a central democratic government of which Sukarno was the head. However, the main island Java, where the capital Jakarta is, was actually much less resource rich than other islands like Sumatra, Borneo and Bali. So the non-Javan islands started to view Java as a new colonial overlord who took their resources, and the Communist Party, otherwise known as the PKI, was starting to become really popular on these islands and were a growing presence in the Indonesian parliament. Seeing where the tide was going, Sukarno made an alliance with the PKI that saw an increase to his presidential powers on the condition that he led Indonesia alongside the PKI. Now, in the early 60s, it was clear that Sukarno wasn't too far from death and the Western Bloc was very worried about the PKI gaining sole power when he died. Behind the Chinese and the Soviets, they were the third largest communist bloc in the world. So immediately after suppressing the coup, Suharto listed one key group as the ones who would have been behind the botched coup, the PKI. And he then went on to launch one of the worst genocides in history, killing anyone remotely associated with them, and then ousting Sukarno himself to become the president and to have a close relationship with the USA. The whole thing couldn't have gone better for the Americans as the third largest communist bloc was completely neutralized and they had a new friend in Southeast Asia. So it begs the question, were the US involved in this mass genocide in any way? Well, let's start by looking at the botched September 30 coup in 1965. Now, it's pretty widely believed that Suharto himself knew about the coup before it happened. This story is backed up by one of the conspirators, Colonel Latif, who also argued that there were some PKI members who were involved in the planning of it, but that it was not actually a party-specific coup, but rather a military one. Latifa argued that Suharto was in on it the whole time, and on two occasions, Suharto was even admitted to meeting with Latif on the 30th of September, with the two accounts being contradictory. Suharto's extremely quick suppression of the Jakarta coup also requires some explanation if he didn't know about it. But the more pertinent question is, did America set up the conspirators for a fall, as a pretext to Suharto eliminating the PKI? And my short answer to that is, yeah, I think that's the most likely explanation. During the time of the coup, the ambassador to Indonesia, Marshall Green, who would later be known as the coup master when he became the ambassador to Australia, boasted of this. I know we had a lot more information about the PKI than the Indonesians themselves. Not only that, but the CIA later confirmed that the PKI had been infiltrated, and so it's totally within the realm of possibility that they were set up, especially considering the conspirators claimed to be supported by the CIA. Not only that, but in the Pakistani Foreign Ministry files, we have an interview between an ambassador and a Dutch NATO intelligence officer dated to December 1964, just under a year before the coup. Remember, the Dutch colonized Indonesia and so they had especially good intelligence on the matter. This was a quote found in the ambassador's report. Indonesia was going to fall into the Western lap like a rotten apple. Western intelligence agencies, he said, would organize a premature communist coup, which would be foredoomed to fail, providing a legitimate and welcome opportunity to the army to crush the communists and make Sakana a prisoner of the army's goodwill. And yes, a fortuitous outcome does not necessarily equal intent. However, just look at how nervous the Americans were about Indonesia falling into the hands of the communists. This was a quote from JFK's former aide, Arthur Schlesinger, about Kennedy being anxious to strengthen the anti-communist forces especially the army, in order to make sure that if anything happened to Sukarno, the powerful Indonesian Communist Party would not inherit the country. Not to mention that in March of 1965, the then US ambassador to Indonesia, Howard Jones, so that's Green's predecessor, said this. An unsuccessful coup attempt by the PKI would provide the ideal pretext for the military to launch its own disguised coup. 
And then lastly, to quote Marshall Green again, When Sukarno announced in his August 17th speech that Indonesia would have a communist government within a year, then I was almost certain. What we did we had to do, though, you better be glad we did because if we hadn't, we sure would be a different place today. Now, Green might have been referring to US involvement in the botched coup, or in what actually came next as Suharto launched one of the worst genocides ever. And on this one, there's no question. America were very supportive of Suharto. With Suharto now the heroic face of Indonesia from saving it from a leftist coup, Sukarno had no decision but to give him full powers to restore stability to the country. This saw the army begin executions of PKI members, but the executions spread across all of Java, with vigilantes joining in killing actual and alleged PKI members. This cultural revolution of sorts spread in all directions to other islands, with death squads raiding villages in northern Sumatra and burning houses to the ground. In Bali, the anti-communist hatred was especially strong because of the culturally ingrained caste system, which emphasised the need for permanent classes of people. 5% of Bali's entire population was killed, and bones are still being found on Bali's beaches today. The army actually had to step in to stop the killings because Suharto's radio broadcast had set so many in Bali ablaze. 750,000 Indonesians were imprisoned. PKI members were executed immediately, while those with looser links like being part of a labour union received hard labour. The death toll was anywhere between 500,000 to 2 million. That's at the very least Rwandan genocide levels, and more likely, Cambodian genocide levels. And yet, we know nothing about it. And why might that be? Because what you're not taught in school is that the CIA allowed this to happen in the name of freedom. Indonesians were literally killed for their political association or religion as part of a big game to protect freedom of political association and freedom of religion across the world. So how were they involved in all of this? Well, firstly, they gave the list of 5,000 names of communist operatives over to the Indonesian army. Well, maybe they did not know what would happen to those 5,000. After all, America was the greatest country of- No, Dennis, they definitely knew. You see, in 2017, the National Security Agency released the telegrams between Washington and their Indonesian embassy, and it is damning. In 1965, the embassy in Java reported on victims being delivered to civilians for slaughter, then a few days later said that the army is delivering 10 to 15 people a night to be killed by Indonesian Muslims. That telegram even said that allowing the civilians to do it took the culpability off of the army. Not only that, but America provided telecoms equipment, gave 50 million reply to the Cap Gestapo death squads, and Marshall Green knew that the broader PKI had no knowledge of the coup and knew that China wasn't behind the coup, but he continued to run with that same narrative in interviews. Folks, Marshall Green light, and I mean light, to the American people. Well, Marshall facts don't care about your feelings. You knew the PKI masses had no involvement in the September 30th movement, so why did you keep peddling that myth? Now, of course, folks, the woke media doesn't want to cover this. Okay, not all deep fakes are tens, but I've got to find some way to break up this depressing content. Now, make no mistake, it wasn't just America who was complicit in this genocide, we played a reprehensible role too. Oz Radio blasted Suharto's army propaganda, and our ambassador to Indonesia, Mick Shan, ordered Oz Radio to focus on the PKI involvement in the coup and not discuss the army's mass killings of Indonesians. Our Prime Minister at the time, Harold Holt, also said to America that with 500,000 to 1 million communist sympathizers knocked off, I think it's safe to assume a reorientation has taken place. But let's be real. This genocide would have happened in spite of Australia's involvement. The same cannot be said for the CIA. Not only were they aiding Sakano, they could have stopped this at any point. They have no problem interfering with the affairs of other nations. Just a few years before, they aided Joseph Mobutu in capturing and then killing the democratically elected leader of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba, for daring to restrict America's access to their rich uranium mines. Need I add that Lumumba was not convicted of, nor even accused of any crime. I get why Harold Holt kissed the ring. Because just 10 years later, when Prime Minister Whitlam dared consider renegotiating America's lease on the Pine Gap spy base, they not only pressured John Kerr to sack Whitlam, they then made sure he lost the imminent election by laundering $10 million into the opposition through a criminal drug bank. Then take your pick, because you bet we'll be covering these. Chile, Ghana, Libya, Grenada, of course Cuba, Bolivia. The CIA has well and truly showed that they have the capacity to intervene in the affairs of other nations. Now, I'm not anti-America, nor even anti-military. I have a ton of respect for admirals like Chester Nimitz and Ernie King. For me, Carter was one of the most admirable leaders of the modern world, and I'll even throw this one in, that were parts of Trump's early foreign policy that I quite liked. 
But the reality is, is that the CIA are all about maintaining the empire, regardless of how inconsistent their morality becomes. If you're going to posit that America is this objectively good force in the world that needs to counter the rise of an authoritarian power like China, remember this. As China was doing its cultural revolution, the CIA was helping Indonesia with an Asian holocaust. The founding fathers might have been very ideological, but the CIA are not. For them, it's a game of empire masquerading under the banner of freedom. Where was the freedom of political association for those involved with the PKI? Where was the freedom of religion for non-Muslims in Bali? Where was the freedom of speech for innocent Javans who just wanted basic working rights and were tarred with the communist brush? I'm not Alex Jones. I'm a history teacher. I don't have any interest in inside job theories or who killed JFK or anything like that. These are the documented facts released by the National Security Agency themselves. But the narrative has been set. And for that reason, issues like this get no attention whatsoever. So share this video with a friend. And if you want to keep learning about the CIA's involvement in other countries, click here to see the crazy story of them helping assassinate Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. And you can also check out this podcast we did on Colonel Gaddafi.